Welcome to you all to the session five of today's seminar. We hope so you have enjoyed your meal. Let us begin at our fifth session uh, on the topic of current issues in aviation law and practice. Of course, it is not easy to have the session right after the meal, so that is all the more reason to grade uh, these uh, sessions moderator with even bigger hand. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Andrew A. O'Hanley, representative of United Kingdom of ICAO, with a big round of applause. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you had a nice lunch. And um, welcome to all those joining us virtually too. My name is Andrew O'Hanley, and I'm the UK's representative to the ICAO Council in Montreal. First of all, I would like to thank the Government of the Republic of Korea, the Minister of Land, Infrastructure and Transport, and my Council colleague, Ambassador Zhang Do Kim, for the warm hospitality and excellent arrangements this week. It's been an important legal seminar, which has also coincided with the 70th anniversary of Korea joining ICAO and the 75th anniversary of the Chicago Convention coming into force. It is, of course, upholding the Chicago Convention that's of key importance as we consider this final session and discuss current issues in aviation law and practice. Although not a theme for discussion today, as a moderator, I'd also like to recognize the concern over another current issue that has been raised here and at the ICAO Council over recent events in Ukraine and the challenges this presents for both the UN Charter and the Chicago Convention. This session now will look at other topical and important aviation legal issues, such as pilotless aircraft and drones, assistance to the families and victims of aircraft accidents, and the Article 84 Settlement of Differences process. We are joined by an excellent panel, some virtually, some in person, who can help guide our discussion. I will introduce the speakers briefly before each presentation, but in the interest of time, I'd like to point everyone to their biographies that are available on the conference website. Our first speaker, who will discuss legal aspects of pilotless aircraft, is Christopher Preteris, a legal officer in the Legal Affairs and External Relations Bureau of ICAO and lead counsel to the Air Navigation Bureau. The floor is yours, Christopher. Thank you. I wanted to begin uh, by echoing the sentiments of Andrew and others of others who have spoken before me and thanking our hosts for uh, this amazing event and for hosting us here. Um, I had the opportunity to attend a previous legal seminar back in uh, 2012, I think it was. And um, it's, it was, until this time, one of the highlights of my ICAO career, and this one uh, I'll just add to that list, and so thank you for that. Um, it's really a, a privilege and a, to have the opportunity to present uh, to you this presentation on legal aspects of pilotless aircraft. Um, these are the th topics I want to uh, talk about here, and I thought I'd begin, um, because we have a, a large and diverse audience, by presenting a, a, a bit of a discussion on the legal foundations of pilotless aircraft and the regulation of pilotless aircraft under the Chicago Convention. And then I want to talk a little bit about uh, the ICAO technical program um, and then look at uh, just really briefly in some ways the, the current legal work of the organization in order to allow um, time for any kind any, uh, questions or, or comments there might be. So I guess to begin, and this may seem really obvious, but um, it's important to note that uh, pilotless unmanned aircraft are aircraft. So for purposes of the Chicago Convention and its annexes, the definition in Annex 7, you see there um, where aircraft is defined 
that all of these aircraft of all different kinds, as you see in the graph there, fall within the, within the broader definition of aircraft. And you see there, I, I, I kind of broke down the, um, the, the type of unmanned aircraft into specific or smaller categories because it often becomes a question um, that we often face uh, being presented to us in the legal bureau about uh, different types of aerial vehicles, whether they qualify as aircraft. And you note there that within the, within the category of remotely piloted aircraft, or RPA, um, there's a, a subcategory. And, and we include in that subcategory, that'll become more important when I talk about the uh, ICAO program, uh, technical program for regulation of pilotless aircraft. Um, but that subcategory uh, are aircraft that it is anticipated will operate in um, non-segregated airspace alongside manned aircraft eventually. And they are, um, ICAO is undertaking the, you know, the imposition of a full, of the full regulatory scheme just as it applies to manned aircraft for that um, category of aircraft. But so we, we kind of talk about r remotely piloted aircraft you know, in our, in our, in, in the building as, in our parlance as the bigs, like, you know, those are the, uh, again, aircraft that we anticipate will fly um, with manned aircraft. And it's important to note that, that, they, that they operate as part of a system. And so we have the, we have the RPA, which is the remotely piloted aircraft, but another common acronym, acronym you'll see in ICAO parlance is the um, RPAS, or the uh, remotely piloted aircraft system. And these aircraft are, of course, piloted from um, a remote pilot station, and that'll become uh, more significant in just a second. Um, then you see the next uh, general kind of category we refer to as small unmanned aircraft, um, which I think in common parlance are referred to as drones. Those, those that are under uh, 25 kilograms is our kind of general definition. But we have, a, and then there's a few others there that are longstanding um, categories of unmanned aircraft, the unmanned free balloons, and then um, finally modeled air, model aircraft. So when we talk about legal foundations for the regulation of pilotless aircraft, we begin with Article 8 of the Chicago Convention. And Article 8 is entitled pilotless aircraft, and so that's the term we use. And, but it's important to recognize that unmanned and pilotless aircraft, it's, it's synonymous. Um, but I want to just break down a few uh, details with regard to Article 8 in terms of um, interpretation and application. So you see that I know generally I don't, you know you don't like to read a, a slide. It's up there for you read, to, for, for you to read, but I'll, I'll just repeat it. Um, so it says no aircraft capable of being flown without a pilot shall be flown without a pilot over the territory of contracting state without special authorization by that state and in accordance with the terms of such authorization. Each contracting state undertakes to ensure that the flight of such aircraft without a pilot in regions open to civil aircraft shall be, shall be so controlled as to obviate danger um, to civil aircraft. And so the first element that I just wanted to highlight here is this idea of being without a pilot um, and the meaning of that. And, and in, in, in the ICAO regime, in the ICAO structure currently, we have to go back um, almost 20 years to the 11th uh, ICAO Air Navigation Conference for where we get our interpretation. And it's interesting to note as you see these pictures and to kind of keep in mind that when we talk about um, this idea of pilotless aircraft, that they're not, they're not such a new thing as we might uh, um, consider them to be. And as, as the uh, photographs demonstrated there, throughout the first half of the 20th century, there were you know, aircraft of pretty significant size um, that were being flown um, flown remotely, and, and, and ending there, you see there that picture of a at the in the 1940s at the time the Chicago Convention was was um, was uh, uh, written. Uh, the there were f large four-engine aircraft, like state-of-the-art aircraft, could, were being flown remotely at that time. And so, in looking at the meaning um, when we talk about without a pilot, you know, we have to keep in mind that the drafters of the convention, when they wrote Article 8, knew about radio-controlled aircraft. They knew about um, what we refer to as remotely piloted aircraft today, and that's an important aspect, I think, historical aspect to consider. 
And so the 11th Air Navigation um, Conference uh, came to the determination that pilotless, <clears throat> in the sense of Article 8 of the Chicago Convention, means without a pilot in command on board the aircraft. So this has important legal implications because it means that first, remotely piloted aircraft are pilotless aircraft, okay? If you are, uh, radio controlled or remotely piloted is pilotless because there's no pilot on board. It follows then that under Article 32, which refers to pilots, that um, a remote pilot, as we now have a definition in Annex 1, uh, to the convention is not a pilot for purposes of Article 32. And then that's followed, in, and I made a note there, that uh, um, <clears throat> Article 32 requires that the license of a pilot um, be issued by the state of registry. But in the case of remotely piloted aircraft, the uh, Air Navigation Bureau made the determination that insofar as they weren't bound by Article 32, that it made more sense in the case of a remotely piloted aircraft to have the um, license of the remote pilot aircraft issued by the state of the operator of the remotely piloted aircraft system. So that's an important distinction there. The next one of these elements I want to touch on is without special authorization. Um, that requirement for special authorization is comparable to the requirement for state aircraft under Article 3C of the convention in that um, so we have in Appendix uh, Annex 2, Appendix 4, a list of requirements for the request for authorization. And, you'll, and when, you, when you look at that list, you'll see it's quite detailed, and it's, the, it's generally the same level of documentation as is required for a certificate of airworthiness. And then also in Annex 2, Appendix 4, um, there's the, it, it provides that pending development of standards, there is no requirement um, that states give mutual recognition to licenses or certificates issued by another state um, for purposes of authorizing overflight. And the last of the elements that I wanted to touch on in terms of highlight in terms of Article 8 is the requirement that the, um, uh, the aircraft be so controlled as to obviate danger to civil aircraft. And again, it's one that generates some questions about meaning. And we would say that uh, as a general rule, this obligation is similar to the due regard obligation that states have under Article 3 with regard to state aircraft. Another or the second of that, they're, that I'm going to touch on here in terms of these legal foundations um, is uh, Article 29 of the Convention. And you see there, Article 29, this isn't an exact quote, it's, it's modified to fit the slide, but it basically <clears throat> lists there, excuse me, lists there the documents that are required to be carried on board. And so you see there that it says all aircraft operating, in, operating internationally, uh, the general requirement of the, of the uh, Article 29, have to carry these documents. And so as we were talking about before, um, since pilotless aircraft or unmanned aircraft are aircraft, this, these requirements apply. So it sets up some uh, challenges in terms of developing regulation for these aircraft when, as we saw in that initial chart that I put up there, um, you have such a diverse, uh, a diverse group of aircraft that fall under the rubric of unmanned aircraft um, under, under Article 8. What this has resulted in from a practical standpoint within ICAO is um, the technical, the regulation of unmanned aircraft falls into two main categories. On the first is the RPAS, the Remotely Piloted Aircraft System, and as I referred to them, the BIGs. And, those, and basically, these aircraft are, are going to be subject to the full regulatory approach and treated just as manned aircraft, and with the idea that they will operate um, under uh, in, uh, IFR, Instrument Flight Rule Conditions, in unsegregated airspace with um, with manned aircraft. And then the second stream there you see is, is other, these uh, other UAS, the other types of unmanned aircraft. And, and I'll talk more about these different tools that are being used or, or methods to develop um, and begin the process of, of international regulation of those. But under the RPAS system, again, we're talking about the full regulatory approach. Um, we're looking um, at the uh, 
uh, development, or, and we'll, I'll show in a second the state of the different standards, but we're looking at the development of the remotely piloted aircraft system operator certificate, um, certificates of airworthiness uh, for, the, uh, for the aircraft, and, it's, and it's, these certificates of airworthiness are somewhat unique in that they have to incorporate all the elements of the system. So even um, in, in, so, in, a, in a precedent setting way, um, they will take into account um, terrestrial elements, such as the remote, li remote pilot station. And there you see there are also new license requirements for the remote pilot. But it goes, the work related to ARPAS goes well beyond that, the full regulatory approaches we talk about. Um, and again, with the objective that these aircraft can operate alongside uh, manned aircraft, the changes to the annexes, annexes to the Chicago Convention are, are significant. And you see there that uh, 18 of the 19 uh, annexes to the Convention are impacted um, by, uh, by the incorporation of, of remotely piloted aircraft systems into the, uh, into the regime. And this just gives you an idea, it's sort of the timeline current timeline of uh, standards in these different areas. You see there that uh, beginning this year already, the Annex 1 um, standards on licensing, licensing of remote pilots are already in place and applicable. Um, the airworthiness and C2 standards are effective and moving toward um, applicability in 2026. And then you see down the road, um, staggered a little bit, other um, other standards, other categories of standards, the, and the anticipated effective date with the, with the idea that uh, they will all be applicable by 2026. And then the, down there at the bottom refers, basically highlights what I mentioned before about the scope of this work, that there are still many other standards that will need to be done that are not yet reflected here in all of these different areas related to, uh, related to international air transport as remotely piloted aircraft systems are brought into the fold. The other work stream I mentioned is this other UAS. Um, ICAO's initial approach when we first started uh, the regulation of unmanned aircraft was really singularly fo focused on the remotely piloted aircraft systems, but around uh, February 5th, uh, 2015, um, with some notable incidents and, and close calls in terms of mid-air collisions. There was a call for ICAO to begin looking at um, action to protect international flights. And so there was actually a state letter issued from the Secretary General highlighting state's responsibility around aerodromes to um, um, take steps to protect uh, international air traffic from interference. You see the photo there, a rather, again, kind of a close call. And we want to avoid those those types of incidents. But then um, the following year um, in, uh, in the 39th Assembly, uh, we had the direction to sort of the, to begin establishing the uh, baseline of SARPs um, for other types of UAS outside of, outside of the ARPAS, the International Framework for ARPAS. And so what's happened with other UAS is uh, um, the same sort of principles they're being looked at as, um, as aircraft, as they are, um, but with a different, with sort of a risk-based approach, looking at the risk that they pose, because in, its, in, in it in some ways um, a, a resource issue, um, but it's also in some ways a, a significance to civil aviation issue. So we have to weigh where these aircraft really come into the come into the scope of international civil aviation. Just, you know, because as I showed earlier with the different types of unmanned aircraft, there are categories of unmanned aircraft such as model aircraft um, that are not subject to international regulation at all because their, their significance in international, um, international aviation is, uh, is de minimis or not significant. And so um, with, with the drones, we're, we're somewhere in between. So we have to, uh, we use this risk-based approach. So you see there that with, with, uh, with drones, and you know, we're looking at maybe instead of a license, um, operational limitations, instead of separation standards, you know, right rules for distance from structures, instead of a certificate of airworthiness, maybe um, consumer uh, product certification. 
aviation, the, the, the standard for aviation safety. We have a standard that we impose on manned aviation in terms of safety, in terms of risk to life. That, that doesn't really, um, uh, isn't really relevant in the, in the uh, drone area. And then in terms of the risk to third parties, there's a huge difference um, of the risk involved with these um, smaller um, types of air vehicles. And so right now, the current, the current state of play is ICAO is acting as a uh, uh, central repository and helping, helping states um, exchange ideas, um, exchange information with the idea of furthering harmonization, that states will harmonize uh, amongst themselves um, by using best practices and so forth as ICAO begins the process of considering um, what areas might, of, of with, with these other UAS, might be um, susceptible to international regulation. What's next? Like in the future, there's, you know, we'll, we'll look to maybe, um, we anticipate there'll be new streams of work as the technology develops um, further. And you see some, uh, some of them there with air mobility um, coming uh, to the forefront lately. And, uh, um, more and more aircraft, uh, you know, the, the technology for autonomous flight, um, that may be the next step or the, or the challenge that's right on the horizon. So what does this mean for uh, the legal bureau specifically? Well, um, my uh, colleague Andrew Avalat, um, in his talk of the uh, uh, work program of the legal committee took you sort of the legislative history of how we got to where we were, where we are, um, and so I just highlight a few things. More the most recent um, developments, and that is we had in the 40, 40th session of the ICAO assembly in 2019 a proposal that the secretariat uh, create a group to harmonize and, and work on, with the technical side to make sure that the legal work of the organization will, relative to unmanned aircraft was progressing. This resulted in the formation of what's now known as the Secretariat Study Group on Legal Issues Related to Pilotless Aircraft. Um, and it was established in February 2020. Um, and as, we, as you note there, that we had initially anticipated the inaugural meeting of the group would be in April 2020, but due to the COVID uh, um, pandemic, that meeting was delayed. But we're happy to report that this uh, last August, in August 2021, um, we held the first meeting of the group. Um, there were several meetings after that, and, and the group has established two subgroups now. We have the subgroup on compliance with the Chicago Convention and the subgroup on liability and security. And several meetings have been held. Um, a lot of items on the agenda, but I just listed a few here. Of, of maybe these are at the, at the top of the heap. Um, looking at the application of the Chicago um, Convention to Pilotless Aircraft, Article 31, that re uh, you know, the requirement that aircraft um, operating in international aviation have a certificate of airworthiness. And for many of these smaller types of UAS, you know, that may not be practical. And we faced this situation before. We faced it, for example, with the balloons, um, where they, they had such a short uh, operational life, uh, it wasn't seen as practical to issue certificates of airworthiness. But it certainly is much different in the case of, of these aircraft. And so that's one of the th areas we're looking. Um, facilitation of unmanned aircraft operations over the high seas is another major uh, uh, area. Um, mutual recognition of licenses and certificates. We talked about before, because of the um, uh, pilotless aircraft falling outside of those provisions of the Chicago Convention, there's not currently a requirement for that mutual recognition. So how, how should that be addressed? Or should we reevaluate that, that interpretation of the Chicago Convention? Is it time to relook at that, that over 20 year or close to 20 year old? interpretation. And then on the, on the security and liability side, we're looking at a stock take, about reviewing treaties, looking for provisions um, such as uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the security area or uh, where, where a number of the uh, treaties refer to their applicability beginning at the time the cabin door is closed. And in the case of these aircraft, we don't, oftentimes don't have cabin doors. Or, you know, we might soon, but the ones that we currently have don't. And that's my time. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Christopher. Um, I think you've set the scene nicely for our second speaker, who will discuss urban air mobility and drone trends in Korea. And that's Byung Ho Gong, the Managing Vice President and Head of Research and Development at Korean Air. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, have you enjoyed the lunch? Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, meet you. And my name is Byung Ho Gong the head of the Korean Air R&D Center. Now, first of all, I would like to express my appreciations to all the parties who invi invited me to the ICAO legal seminar. Today, I will present UAM and drone trends in Korea and Korean Air. Uh, the presentation will be made in the following order. The Korean, is, uh, Korean Air is the world's leading global airline and also the only airline of the aircraft manufacturer. Korean Air is a traditional airline that was uh, established uh, 54 years ago and uh, we have uh, 21,000 employees. Despite the COVID pandemic and uh, abnormal passenger business situation, last year we achieved $7 billion sales due to the strong cargo business. Yeah, uh, Korean Air is the main business area as passenger, cargo, and uh, aerospace, which I am working in. I would like to introduce aerospace division, uh, uh, which I am working in the field. Um, I believe a picture is worth a thousand words. Let's see the video. Going beyond what is possible and seeking to create something much more valuable, Korean Air's innovation, passion, and spirit of challenge live on. Korean Air is the world's only integrated airline, operating not only the passenger and cargo transportation businesses, but also the aerospace business. Korean Air is involved in aircraft manufacturing, maintenance, and modification, as well as developing unmanned aerial vehicles. In 1969, Korean Air unlocked the pathway that connected Korea to the world. In 1976, Korean Air made its dreams come true with the 500MD the first helicopter to be assembled and manufactured in Korea. In the 1980s, Korean Air set another milestone with the production of the F-5 Chegongho, a combat fighter aircraft. The airline went on to design, develop, and launch the UH-60 mid-sized helicopter, advancing the nation's aircraft manufacturing skills. Korean Air also played a major role in the successful launch of Naroho, the nation's first space vehicle project in early 2013. Today, the airline plays a leading role in the joint development of aircraft and manufactures fuselage and wing structures of future aircraft. Korean Air has set its sights on the repair and upgrade of civilian and military aircraft and also the development of next generation aircraft such as unmanned aerial vehicles. Components created one by one come together to form an aircraft that flies around the world. As a leading player in the international joint development of commercial aircraft, Korean Air manufactures and supplies major aircraft components to partner firms such as Boeing and Airbus. Korean Air designs and manufactures high quality products with its latest equipment and technologies making the airline a preferred partner in the development of next-generation aircraft. New technologies include automated fiber placement techniques, co-curing, automatic ultrasonic inspection, and an efficient and lean production line system.
Korean Air has successfully developed and completed the delivery of six core composite structures for the Boeing 787, as well as structures for the Airbus 350 and 320. With passion for perfection and a heart for the people, Korean Air constantly creates newer and greater values. Korean Air performs repair and maintenance on aircraft in large-scale hangars at Incheon International Airport, Kimpo International Airport, and Busan Tech Center. Heavy maintenance can be performed on up to 120 large-scale commercial aircraft annually. The hangar space accommodates more than three wide-body aircraft. As Asia's largest military aircraft MRO depot, Korean Air has worked on more than 3,500 aircraft for the Korean and U.S. Armed Forces for more than 40 years. The airline also upgrades and repairs various combat fighter aircraft and helicopters for both the Korean and U.S. Armed Forces. Recently, Korean Air is involved in aircraft conversion, enabling the undertaking of special military missions. It also began the development of technologies for the conversion of commercialized manned aircraft to unmanned aircraft. Fully equipped with innovative facilities and skilled technicians, Korean Air is renowned for its high-quality maintenance work on computers, electrical devices, instruments, and fuel, and pneumatic hydraulic components for various aircraft. The airline's paint hangar was built to environment-friendly specifications, capable of painting a large-scale Boeing 747-400 aircraft within 10 days. Korean Air handles up to 30 aircraft per year. Korean Air also specializes in paint illustrations on aircraft exteriors. Korean Air unlocks the sky of the future with outstanding skills and innovative passion. Korean Air is a pioneer in the development and manufacturing of UAVs in Korea. In 2012, the airline successfully developed the medium altitude UAV. It is now in the process of developing a divisional surveillance UAS for the Korean Army and Marine Corps. In addition to radar signature reduction technologies for the unmanned combat aerial vehicle. Tilt Rotor UAV, KUSTR, which is under development, is receiving attention as innovative UAV technology. With experience in the nation's satellites, Korean Air is participating in the development of next generation satellite structures and solar panel drive systems. Korean Air has taken the unlimited possibilities and created greater value for its business. Korean Air's passion and drive to succeed in aerospace is now being fulfilled. Korean Air goes above and beyond to reach new heights of excellence. Okay, uh, as you watched in the video, this is the summary chart for the, our works. Uh, first, 1970s uh, through uh, 1990s, we uh, manufactured some uh, air platform with the international license. After 20, uh, 2000s, uh, we uh, joined the international developments with the major OEM uh, like uh, 
Boeing and Airbus. Uh, 2010, to present, we are developing the many drones and uh, UAV. Especially, today's topic, UAM and uh, UAV, uh, have, uh, have been developed and uh, developed starting with the, we call the close range UAV, uh, R&D, and uh, male UAV, it's uh, a 26 meter wingspan, um, something like that. Okay, now uh, I'm gonna introduce some Korea uh, UAM and uh, UAV trends. First, the UAM, as you know, UAM stands for the urban air mobility using the EV VTOL. South Korea has a government red goal of initial commercialization in 2025. In 2020, the UAM Team Korea, the center of a public private cooperation, was established to form the UAM ecosystems in Korea. In addition, uh, the grand challenge, a large scale public private demonstration project has been uh, planned since 2023. UAV was first used for military purposes and now developed quickly enough to be used in all industry areas. Recently, smart drone have been developed through the technology convergence, such as AI and the swarming technology. The UAM Team Korea, uh, we have established the UAM roadmap and the technical roadmap and uh, have prepared an published operation concepts. In addition, subcommitted by major sectors are formed and uh, constant discussions are taking place. Finally, our government is continuously holding demonstration events using UAM aircraft to enhance the social acceptance. For the initial commercialization of uh, UAM in 2025, our government is playing the KUM Grand, Grand Challenge. Korean Air will also participate in the demonstration project and contribute to the early settlement of the domestic UAM industry and the formation of ecosystems. The private sector is making various unique efforts to form the UAM ecosystem, such as Hyundai Motor Company, HANA System. Korean Air also is discussing a way to play a role as a UAM operator and PSU. Yeah. The history of drones began with the development of the reconnaissance drones throughout the development of the Korean Air's Kus 7 and 9. The technology of Korean drones has been improved. We also actively engaged in commercialization of a manned air vehicle by developing medium high attitude manned air vehicle we call the MUAV for strategic military UAV. Also, our government is creating an environment in which high-tech new technology can be quickly applied to the unmanned air vehicle through the rapid acquisition program.
Uh, Manned aircrafts are under development for use in variety of environments and uh, verifiable facilities are being built. Cow delivery, forest fire monitoring, rescue mission, surveillance, etc. How is Korean Air preparing for the future? First, we provide an integrated transportation service that leads excellence in flight. We have participated in UAM Team Korea and contributed to the establishment of an industrial ecosystem suitable for the domestic environment. We also participate in a consortium led by Hyundai Motor Company. In February of this year, our consortium created the UEM ecosystem blueprint and presented a, a blueprint for each area. Within the UEM ecosystem, Korean Air will serve as a UEM operator and a PSU. In addition, we plan to develop our own R&D as well as our own UAM operational control system and the virtual operational environments, as well as the participation in a demonstration of government issues. Finally, we have a plan for developing risk assessment system for safe UAM operation. Next, I will introduce a representative drone developed by Korean Air, the hybrid drone developed by our company specialized in flight time so that it can operate for up to two hours using an internal combustion engine and battery. Developed by Korean Air, hybrid drone has completed demonstrations such as delivering goods to more than 60 kilometers of island and monitoring the river basin environment. Now finally, the swarming inspection drone, which uses four drones simultaneously for airplane inspection, such as lightning strike damages. Korean Air has integrated swarming technology into existing drones to effectively operate them. Developed for ensuring mechanics safety at height work and increasing operational efficiency by reducing ground maintenance time. First, create inspection plan and running swarming based on the plan you create to get an image. We use artificial intelligence to automatically analyze the acquired images for defects and inspect them if necessary. Last December, a demonstration event was held at the hangar of Korean Air's headquarters with the Molit Agency. And it is being tested in extended fields such as bridges and shipbuilding. So far, I have talked about the trend of UAM and the drones in Korea and the Korean Air's contribution. Korea is developing related systems and the technology in cooperation with the government, industry, academia, and research institute for the commercialization of UAM. Thanks to the, this effort, we believe the UAM will fly safety, safely through the city center in the near future. Korean Air con continued to cooperate and consult with UAM and UAV related stakeholders. We will also make every effort to develop technology and establishment international standards. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you.
Thank you so much to both of our um, speakers for what I think is quite a complimentary pair of presentations, um, looking at the legal and regulatory issues relating to pilotless aircraft and drones as it tries to keep up with the pace of innovation, including at Korean Air. Now, we do have some time available um, for questions. Do we have any questions from the floor? See one of the back in the middle. Good afternoon. I am Bilum Lizette from Cameroon, Civil Aviation Authority at the Korean Aerospace University as a student. First, I would like to thank the speakers for their very, very enriching presentations. But I have a little worry with um, with regards to drones. Lately, we recognize that the, the, our young generation are very much interested in the recreational drones, in their, in their drones for recreational activities, most especially photography. My question is, does the ICO envisage to mitigate the risks posed by these little drones, which are being used by unlicensed, pilots? True, um, the FAA says to get a license, you need to be 16 years of age. But we find in stores drones for kids less than 16 years old. That's my first question. And sec my second question is, what is going to be the age limit to obtain a drone license, given that the increase in this activity keeps moving us. Every, all, everyone is so um, interested in the, in the usage of these little drones. Thank you. Thank you so much for your questions. Christopher, would you like to have a first go at that relating to congested airspace, particularly around here? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, think, I think part of the focus of the question, if I understood it, um, related to uh, um, license requirements for drones. Generally, um, those are still uh, st regulations of states, and so we don't have a, an international regulation related to licensing for drones. Um, so I don't want to speak too much on, on state regulations on, that I may not be totally familiar with, but at least, I think you mentioned the FAA, my, at least my understanding is that um, for recreational use, they don't require a license. It would only be in a commercial setting. But I guess if you have a young expi um, aspiring uh, drone photographer, they may face some issues in terms of getting a, uh, a drone license. Was the, yeah. And what about the second question relating to what kind of age would you set for the introduction of a license if necessary? Well, at least with the, um, you know, so far, as I mentioned, the, the um, regulation that ICAO has undertaken is in the area of remotely piloted aircraft. And so um, Annex 1, you know, is replete with all of the qualifications that are required and educational requirements. And so those similar kinds of requirements um, will be developed for the um, remote pilots that will be flying those aircraft. Uh, and given the uh, level of sophistication, I don't know that the, of those aircraft, I don't know that yet we have to worry about the, the age too much. Um, you know, when it, when it, again, when I think when it comes to drones, and it's one of the reasons uh, that um, I think the approach that ICAO is taking with regard to the formation of regulations is really sound, is that it's really a risk-based approach. So we look at what the risks are in terms of um, you know, defining uh, the regulations or what needs to be regulated. And so in the case of, um, you know, the scenario where, where um, children or, or young people are using recreational drones, um, you know, generally I think we're, it's, it's a pretty low risk uh, type of activity. Um, when it comes to around aerodromes, you know, that's a different scenario where, where safety is at stake. And that's where, you know, the standards and regulations related to aerodromes and, and geofencing and things like that to uh, remove those threats from airports would become important. Thank you, Christopher. I think we've got time for one more question. 
I see your hand over here. Um, thank you so much, uh, presenters. My name is Adru Kavakubia from Uganda, also a student at uh, Korea Aerospace University with interest around the area. Uh, my question goes to Chris, Christopher, and I want to draw you to the different terms that exist around this area. We have unmanned aircraft, unmanned aircraft vehicle, UAV, UAS, ARPAS, drones, and etc. And uh, from um, uh, a legal perspective, and uh, these jargon of terms, are they not so many and uh, a risk to cause confusion and also drawing clear distinctions between these many aspects of uh, this, this uh, area? And then also from uh, the states in terms of developing legal framework, isn't it too much for the states to kind of develop a legal framework for each of these terms if you're referring to remotely piloted aircraft systems and then UAS, UAVs, and, uh, and then drones? Thank you. I, th I think you bring up a really good point um, about the terminology, and I think you know, some of that stems from the fact that we're dealing with a technology that developed very rapidly um, before a lot of regulation uh, was really considered and, 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 and before the technology was, uh, began to get into um, the hands of, of commercial and, and civil activities. So you had this uh, divergent, uh, divergent terminology. Um, we rely, you know, primarily the, the main uh, 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 definitional term, I guess, that we, you know, we take ours from the Chicago Convention, which refers to pilotless aircraft. Um, for, for um, maybe for convenience sake, we've, we've introduced unmanned, or pilotless parenthesis, unmanned, because of the questions that pilotless brings up about remotely piloted aircraft, about whether those are considered pilot, uh, um, piloted or not. And so um, I think partly to address those questions, we've started, you know, we have pilotless parenthesis unmanned. Um, and then with the remotely piloted aircraft systems versus unmanned aircraft, basically distinguishing between those two regulatory regimes. But um, yeah, I think, I think over time um, we will, uh, as, as more and more of the aircraft fall under uh, different regulatory uh, requirements, there will, will find standardization. It's, it's like, like we have with our PAS. Um, we'll find that in the small um, unmanned aircraft, drone type of uh, environment too. We'll settle on terms as more and more of those activities um, become regulated. Thank you so much. Do we have any final questions from the floor? I see one hand here. I think that'll be the last question. Yes. Thank you, moderator. My name is Peter Yu from Molit. I have a, a question regarding what just mentioned by Chris, uh, Article 8 of Chicago Convention, Pilot Aircraft. Uh, looking, looking forward and 10 years later, probably the autonomous flight technology will be available. The much has been said whether or not the interpretation of the Article 8 of the Chicago Convention could be accommodate the autonomous flight technology in terms of reliability and flight rules, obligations kind of things. That's the first question and relating to that uh, what's going on on the uh, RPS, uh, the panel to develop the standard for the uh, autonomous aircraft, whatever it is, could it be UAM or RPS in the future? Thank you. I'll, um, I guess I would just start by saying, I mean, from my experience, um, the the Chicago Convention is remarkable. It's a remarkable document, and the, and the little part that I had with the photos and the history. I mean, the 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 folks that that wrote it. I mean, they really were prescient in so many ways of addressing things and make producing a document with the annexes that is really flexible. And we've been able to to evolve and develop 
to meet the various challenges of aviation and the developments in technology. Um, whether these new developments, like autonomous aircraft, will require um, changes, I, I, you know, I don't know, but I, I tend to think no. Ju I mean, just based on, ex you know, just based on, I guess, pride in the convention. Um, but um, regarding specifically about the uh, um, work of the ARPES panel, I know, sp I know that they are, have already begun, the questions have come up about um, autonomous aircraft. We've been addressing questions related to what is the, you know, uh, one of the other speakers earlier um, in the um, seminar spoke about having an autonomous aircraft with a backup pilot on board. And we've been um, addressing questions like that. What does that mean legally? Because um, it would appear that legally, if there's a pilot on board, it's not a pilotless aircraft anymore. So we, you know, it, it challenges which regime applies. And so I know it's, uh, the work is underway, but I, I, you know, I don't know, you know, specifically in terms of how they, that, um, uh, those aircraft have been categorized. Thank you so much. And I think that's us out of time for this um, section. Thank you so much to both of our speakers for a fantastic um, introduction to um, a pilotless aircraft and drones. Um, thank you so much. We'll move on now to our second session. Thank you. So we, our next two speakers will join us remotely. Um, just check that Frances Francisco and Rob can hear us okay? Uh, yep. Yes. Thumbs up, perfect. Absolutely. Um, both speakers are very experienced lawyers um, who will discuss the issue of assistance to aircraft accident victims and their families. Um, this, in fact, will be a continuation of a, of a conversation um, that was started last December at the first ICAO symposium um, on the same issue in Gran Canaria, uh, Spain. Um, first we'll hear from Francisco Vasquez Tenero, who is an independent procedural lawyer who has represented aircraft accident victims and their families and in Spain. The floor is yours. Thank you, greetings from Spain. I am grateful for this opportunity to present to you on behalf of the International Federation of air accident victims and their families, a proposal for the common good for the users and professionals of the international civil aviation. This federation, created in Madrid in 2015 by the Victims Association of Spain, AVGK5022, Germany, HIP447, and Pakistan, AB202, is the first and only federation of victims recognized by ICAO. It was born with the idea of giving a voice to the victims and families of air accidents in international organizations. This international federation of air accident victims and their families motto is victims helping victims. It Chairwoman is Mrs. Pilar Vera Palmes, also president of the Victims Association of Spain, ABCK 5022. As a pro bono collaborating lawyer for the International Federation of Air Accident Victims and Their Families in this ICAO legal forum, I will first talk about the working paper 434 that this federation presented at the last 40th ICAO General Assembly. Based on the different experiences suffered by victims belonging to the Federation and regarding the treatment that the different insurers have given to the victims of air accidents according to the state in which the accident occurred. The Assembly discussed it and the purpose was for the states to recall the ICAO resolutions regarding compensation to victims, insurers, and air operators, urging all agents involved in an air accident 
to support the best practices of insurers in the treatment of assistance to victims and to inform and exchange information through ICAO and to facilitate access to this information to states and international organizations. Likewise, the Council was urged to implement the appropriate requirements through the ICAO Universal Safety Oversight Audit Program so that the states provide the best practices in compliance with compensation to the victims, survivors, and families of an air accident. Secondly, I refer to the historic first ICAO International Symposium on assistance to victims and families of air accidents held in Spain on the island of Gran Canaria on December 2021, in which I share with some of those present in this legal forum my assistance as a speaker. There, 30 conclusions were established that were approved by the ICAO Council held on February of this year. Among them is the organization under the auspices of ICAO of a seminar on best practices by states in the treatment in the territory of indemnities by insurers and air operators. In the aforementioned symposium, I explain my vision of how to approach this problem from a professional point of view as a defense lawyer for victims of air accidents. It gives me great pleasure to present this today to my colleagues from the legal world of ICAO member states and the organization itself. I must begin telling you about my experience with the fatal accident of a Spanair flight JK5022. This was a scheduled domestic passenger flight from Madrid Barajas Airport to Gran Canaria Airport, Spain, that crashed just after takeoff from Madrid Airport on 20th August 2008. Of the 172 passengers and crew on board, 154 died and 80, 18 survived. A lot of things went wrong that day. But the airline did one thing right. The lives of all and each one of the victims of that air crash were covered with a total amount of $1,500 million. I beg you to consider this figure for a second. $1,500 million for each plane and for each accident, meaning that each victim had their personal damages covered in an average of $9 million. Being so, what compensation received the 18 survivors and the families of the 154 deceased? Thanks to a parliamentary investigation commission, we now know that the total compensation paid by the insurer for this air crash approximately totals to $43 million. That means an average of $250,000 per victim. $250,000 of the $9 million covered by the insurance policy for each victim. That's less than a 3%. As you can imagine, neither the victims nor their families regard such figure as a fair amount. The reasons behind that miserly 3% of compensation are not exclusive of the Spanish or European legal systems. This problem is shared by the whole civilized world. It is difficult that the compensation could reach a 10% of an insurance coverage like this one. That means that if the air companies made a huge economic effort to grant a millionaire coverage for the possible victims of an air crash, the states fail when it comes to executing that opportunity. Old laws and ancient legal customs promote 
that more than 90% of the provided compensation does not meet its goal. I think that ICAO must react promptly against this sad reality. The International Civil Aviation is undoubtedly, for me, the most efficient expression of the humankind, even above the space exploration or the military corps. No mistake is permitted because the most insignificant error can lead to a tragedy like what happened with Spanish flight JK5022. So if the international civil aviation must comply with an efficiency ratio of 100%, it must pursue that the compensations to the victims when the system fails does not total only a 3% of the coverage of the insurance that the airlines have paid to protect the lives of the passengers. How could ICAO and aviation improve the compensation system of damages from an air crash? In Spain, we had an only ruling, one sentence from a provincial court that implemented the international legislation and multiplied by almost four times this average compensation. That judgment was later revoked by the Supreme Court. But I think that that sentence showed us the way. I invite you to follow that example and change the future. Change the world in an easy and feasible way. The Article 25 of the Montreal Convention says clearly that the air companies may increase without limits, their responsibility. So they can increase the coverage of the damages as much as they want or need. The problem is that if an airline applies Article 25 of the Montreal Convention, assuring the damages caused by its activity in millions of dollars, as did Spanair in 2008, the final compensation will be only a very small percentage of that amount, regardless of the country where that compensation is due. I think that ICAO must work in the immediate future to establish a proportionality between the coverage of the insurance and the compensation, enforcing the true meaning of the Article 25 of the Montreal Convention. But this is just an ideal you can implement it in the Montreal Convention or in any other international law that you see fit. It can be any way to find, to reach one simple goal, to establish a direct and proportional link between the compensation to the victims and families of an air crash and the insur insurance coverage. You may hear that this proportionality will risk the economic stability of the civil aviation sector. Really? I don't think so. If the victims of an air crash and their families receive, instead of a 2 or 3% of the coverage of the policy, a fair amount, 50% or 40 or 30 of that coverage, depending of, on its amount, that proportional breach between the compensations and the coverage will make, undoubtedly, a better future and a more caring world. Including this, including in this IKEA legal forum a section, this section on assistance to victims is a very good first step. Thank you. But ICAO should lead, in view of the appalling air accidents of the last five years a great meeting between all the parties involved who study and seek a consensus that balances the interests of victims and insurers. It will be difficult, but it will be possible. I formally so request, not only on behalf of the President of the International Federation of Air Accident Victims and Their Families, but also of the legal professionals who defend victims, that I care include 
among its events, specific seminars on this matter to carry out the modifications and innovations that update and harmonize the necessary balance between, between the aforementioned parties. The Montreal Convention, European and American regulations, etc., show the way. It would, it would only be a matter of complying with it to avoid people who suffer the loss of their loved ones, additional suffering that can even last for years. The air accidents that have occurred in the last 10 years in the world have overwhelmed us all. International civil aviation has advanced a lot in all possible aspects, except in the one dedicated to the treatment that insurers give to the victims. The requirements demanded by the authorities to the airlines to be able to operate are very strict. However, in the event of an accident, compliance with their, with their obligation is not required with the same intensity. As legal professionals, practicing lawyers, we are also responsible for ensuring that our clients receive fair, dignified treatment in accordance with the contract required and enforced between the parties involved in an air, in an air disaster. By last, from the International Federation of Air Accident Victims and Their Families, I convey the message of its president, Pilar Vera, that although it is an illusion now, we must believe that the exchange of these best practices can effectively contribute to making it a reality. We can all become, if we fly, victims. Let's do everything we can to try to solve these problems because it will be good for the entire international civil air transport community in the world. This is my presentation for now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Francesco, for getting us started and sharing your perspective. Next, we'll hear from Rob Lawson, QC, who is a partner at Clyde & Co. in the UK and has represented both airlines and insurers. The floor is yours, Rob. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm very sorry I can't be with you, but I want to thank ICAO for this opportunity to speak with you and to take issue with Francesco yet again. Uh, as we did in Las Palmas last year. Hello, Francesco. I'm glad you're well. As Andrew says, I sit on the other side of the fence. I'm asked to provide the airline and insurer perspective on this very important issue. The views that I will express are, however, my personal views alone, but they're based on my experience representing airlines and their insurers in relation to air accidents for over 30 years, and so I hope that they'll be said to carry at least some weight. I'm going to make five points to you today, and the first is this, that airlines and their insurers want legal certainty and international uniformity in terms of liability exposure to accident victims and their families. And there are two interrelated reasons for this. First of all, so that liability can be covered on a fair and reasonable basis. That's to say, it can be insured against as an appropriate premium by that being set, bearing in mind the likely exposure. And secondly, and this is a point on which Francesco will beg to differ with me, so that all legitimate claims can be settled at a fair and reasonable level of compensation according to the law. And that's a point that I'll return to. Without undue delay or legal expense, including by way of protracted legal proceedings, especially concerning jurisdictional and conflict of law disputes or issues of primary liability. And I can certainly say from my personal experience that insurers do not enjoy spending money on their own lawyers if that is not strictly necessary. 
The Warsaw and Montreal Conventions provide a means to this end. In particular, both provide an exclusive legal regime which imposes liability for damage sustained in the case of death or injury caused by an accident taking place on the aircraft and importantly, without proof of fault. So there's always liability in the case of death or physical injury in air crash on the part of the carrier. Noting, of course, that insurance only engages in respect of legal liability, so there needs to be a fixed legal threshold in order to determine when it is engaged. Of these two conventions, the Montreal Convention, which as I'm sure you know is a modernized version of Warsaw, provides a balance more favorable to accident victims and their families in a number of respects, respects. And I'm going to identify three. First of all, in terms of potentially available jurisdiction, Warsaw provides four the territory of a state party in which the carrier is domiciled, has its principal place of business, where uh, the place of business through which the contract was made, and the place of destination. Montreal adds a fifth, which in essence, in the case of death or injury of a passenger, gives jurisdiction also in the territory of the state party in which that passenger had their principal and permanent residence at the time of the accident, provided that the carrier has a presence there in its own right uh, or uh, indirectly via relations with another carrier who does. So that this fifth jurisdiction will usually mean that the victim of their or their families can obtain jurisdiction in their home state. This is important because, as I will explain in my fifth point, what compensation is available is set by the law of the state having jurisdiction. This fifth jurisdiction therefore ensures that the victim or their family can get compensation of the types and according to the standards and expectations of their home state, which is likely to be where their loss will be felt and suffered. Secondly, the Montreal Convention does not have any artificial maximum limit of liability for personal injury or death, i.e. of the compensation that's recoverable, whereas the, Montreal, uh, the Warsaw Convention does, absent any contractual agreement to a higher sum or the waiver of that artificial limit. The limit the plaintiff then needs to break through represents a high hurdle, not often overcome. Where the Warsaw Convention applies, depending on the particular version in play, this artificial maximum limit can be as low as under $10,000 and only goes up to a figure of approximately $138,000. So it is not a very high level at all, certainly compared to values normally in play in many Western societies. Thirdly, the Montreal Convention allows a more limited no negligence defense. Under the Warsaw Convention, this can be invoked from the ground up. So the carrier might have a complete defense to a claim, meaning that the plaintiff interest could potentially get nothing. But under the Montreal Convention, it can only be invoked for damages exceeding a sum now set at 128,000 SDRs, which is a figure of approximately $176,000. My second point is that notwithstanding these advantages, the Montreal Convention has not yet achieved as widespread adoption by state parties as the Warsaw Convention has. The Warsaw Convention has been adopted by 152 countries and 137 in its form is modified by the Hague Protocol of 1955 whereas the Montreal Convention has only been adopted by 135, so 17 less. And neither convention applies to purely domestic carriage, including within that carriage that's not international uh, between states' parties to these conventions. 
This is important because it can lead to anomalous results, including in relation to people on the same flight, because the convention applies um, as determined by the place of departure and destination according to the contract of carriage that the passenger has, which may cover a number of flights and not simply the actual flight they're on at the time of their accident. So that on any given flight, you may have a row of three people, each subject to a different legal regime. One, subject to the Montreal Convention because the passenger's contract of carriage begins and ends in a state party to that convention, and thus the person has all of its benefits. One subject to the Warsaw Convention because the contract begins and ends in states party to that convention, even if one of them might be party to Montreal, in which case the passenger is subject to the prima facie artificial limits of liability of that convention. And one subject to neither of these conventions, so that the remedies that they have will lie in the domestic law of whatever country the passenger interests happen to be able to obtain jurisdiction. And this is not just a hypothetical issue. It's something that we as a firm have come across regularly in relation to recent major losses. One can question whether it's fair that three passengers sitting in a row can be subject to such different legal regimes. I submit that these anomalies should be corrected, i.e. all states should now sign up to the Montreal Convention so that it applies to all international carriage. And the Montreal Convention should also be extended to cover all other carriage by commercial air carriers, including domestic as well. My third point is that there is also a significant gap that I think can and should be filled, which concerns the making of advanced or interim payments in the cases of hardship. At present, the Montreal Convention merely provides that carriers shall make a payment if required to do so by its national law. But not many national laws require this, and there's certainly no uh, uniform international approach. I submit that a system of advanced payments to meet immediate economic needs should also be brought in on a standardized basis so that all passenger interests have the same right to legal assistance. My fourth point is that there is a role model that answers both my second and my third point. It's provided by the European Union in the form of its regulation 2027 of 97 as amended. This applies the Montreal Convention to the carriage of passengers and baggage to all flights by EU air carriers, whatever the place of departure and destination. It also requires advance payments to be made of not less than a figure for approximately $22,000 within a specified time, a time frame of no later than 15 days after the identity of the natural person entitled to compensation has been established. I submit that consideration should be given to adopting similar provisions as part of any further revision of the Montreal Convention. My fifth and last point relates to recoverable damages. The Warsaw and Montreal Conventions only permit the recovery of compensatory damages, with the Montreal Convention providing expressly that punitive, exemplary, or other non-compensatory damages shall not be recoverable. Further, the conventions do not prescribe what is recoverable by way of damages when their liability is engaged. That's therefore left to be determined by the law of the state having jurisdiction. There's no international convention in any sector dealing with what is recoverable as damages. And whilst in principle, I think that that would be a good idea, it's doubtful in the extreme that sufficient international consensus could be obtained on the issue to make one possible. 
simply because the views on what is fair compensation vary so greatly between states and indeed on the standards of living and culture in different states. What this means is if there is dissatisfaction as to what is recoverable as compensatory damages by the victims of air accidents and their families, as Francesco so admirably articulates, or indeed as the time it takes for that to be determined, then the complaint should be directed at the law of the state having jurisdiction. It's not something that's capable of international resolution. There's one further proposition that needs to be laid to rest. And this is Francesco's suggestion that the compensation in fact recoverable following an air accident should be fixed by reference to the maximum level of insurance that the carrier holds. This is impermissible because it's like comparing a cat with a dog, two very different things which are not to be confused. Insurance is always provided subject to a cap, which is set at the maximum possible extent of the financial exposure the insurers will accept in the very worst case scenario that can be considered realistic, even if it's a remote possibility. And of course, we all hope that it is. That gives the carrier certainty that it has cover to meet all reasonably foreseeable eventualities. And it's usually for a very significant sum for any one event. It is, however, contrary to what Francesco says, not a sum that insurers readily have at their disposal. Rather, it's a sum that they can call upon if needed, but on the basis that this will be rarely, if ever, required. If it were otherwise, the insurance industry would quite simply not be sustainable, which would not be to the long-term benefit of either airlines or the traveling public. An insurance cap should not, therefore, be regarded as a pot that can or is expected to be emptied in relation to every single loss. What insurers agree to cover is the legal liability that the airline in fact incurs, i.e. the compensation that it is in fact required to pay to the victims of an accident and their families up to the agreed cap. If the pot was to be emptied every time and split amongst the victims and their families, then this would result in them getting far more than would be fairly or justly uh, compensation for their losses. Most especially, it would be far more than they would be able to obtain as compensation in any comparable situation according to the general law of the state having jurisdiction. It would also be contrary to the prohibition of anything other than the recovery of compensatory damages contained in the Montreal Convention. Now, no one will suggest that the Warsaw or Montreal Conventions are perfect. They are, like all international treaties, creatures of compromise. And they have their virtue, at least in bringing some international certainty and uniformity to air carrier liability, which I think is to the benefit of the victims of air accidents and their families. What we all must do is ensure that the system is strengthened where possible, which is why I make the recommendations that I have today. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to say thank you so much to both Francesco and Rob for sharing their perspectives so openly on what is a difficult subject for the aviation industry to address. Um, having attended the symposium um, last year, 
um, in Gran Canaria. It was impossible not to be humbled um, by the strength of the families as we were sharing the testimony um, in the discussion, all of which will help make our um, policy on this subject better. Um, do we have any questions from the floor? We have some time available um, for questions. I see one at the back right. Good afternoon. My name is Alina Umyarova. I'm from Korea Space University. In accordance uh, with European Union Regulation 2022-328, Article uh, 3C2, prohibits provision by uh, European persons of insurance and reinsurance directly or indirectly in relation to goods and te technology listed in Annex 11 to any person, entity, or body in Russia or for use in Russia. The question is, could you please comment how it will affect non-Russian airlines which are conducting flights into and out of Russia in context of aircraft accidents? Thank you. Jessica, should I take that one? It's more my field than yours, I think. Um, the, the, I, I don't want to get too much into the politics, if, if I may. Um, the, the position in relation to, to sanctions, um, uh, certainly as far as Europe and the UK is concerned, um, is that uh, there should be, in essence, a minimum contact um, with, with Russia. The way um, insurance policies work, certainly when they're written in London, is that there is a provision, it's called AVN 111, um, which means that uh, if uh, a payment is uh, subject to or, or potentially in, in conflict with uh, a sanctions prohibition, it can't be made. The position generally being taken by uh, European, and I include in that the UK, um, insurers at the moment, is that there is not insurance coverage in relation to flights into or out of uh, Russia, uh, because that is insurance for use in Russia, which is the phrase the sanctions um, do not permit. So um, at, at present, um, there is a, an insurance hiatus, let's say, um, in, in relation to uh, coverage of, of by um, Western insurers in relation to flights into or, or out of uh, uh, Russia. But, but this is a matter of controversy and not necessarily accepted by everyone. Thank you, Rob. Do we have any more questions from the floor? Well, perhaps we can go back to the symposium last year. And as you both know, we came up with a list of about um, 30 recommendations um, for ICAO and others to help take forward. Um, from your perspectives, um, what were the top priorities that we should focus on first? Um, Francesco, would you like to start off, perhaps? Well, for me, the, uh, thank you, Rover, for your insight on this. Uh, I appreciate very much uh, discussing with you all these matters. Well, I, I, from the point of view of the victims, uh, when we, we find uh, that the jurisdiction is very important at the time to decide what's the compensation that the victims receive, I think, I, I think that we, we should work. Uh, we have a lot of uh, work uh, be, uh, in front of us to clarify those aspects that Robert has told us about the difficulties that insurers have at the time to, to pay a, a fair compensation to the victims. I, I, I would like to, to say that um, we are always thinking about uh, a, a wide range of regulations, uh, difficult regulations to, 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 to find a proportionality and that the system, international system, that you are working so hard to establish can be really 
respected with the times to the state laws. I think that's the, the first problem. So I think the, the example that I've, I've, I've said, Article 25 of the Montreal Convention is an empty article. It's a very important article. It's an article that is saying us that if I have a, an airline company, I can increase the coverage of the damage as much as I want. But in reality, that article is empty. So that's only a small example of a lot of different problems that we have now. And that's, uh, <clears throat> that's why I say we cannot solve this in 10, 15 minutes in, in an important forum like this. We should be treating this together. Uh, the international community should be treating this together. We should be uh, seeing all the point of views, analyzing the last years of these uh, legal problems and defining a new strategy to, to solve this. That's what I think. Thank you so much. And Rob, over to you. Uh, Andrew, I, I would have to agree with you that I was enormously humbled at the symposium um, by the dignity of the International Federation and their speakers. And I include within that um, Francesco. Um, and of course, like everyone on our side, we, we recognize the suffering that victims and their families go through. To me, the most important thing was that the dialogue was taking place with people in the same room, physically or virtually. I think that we need to break down misconceptions and barriers between us. Airlines don't want to treat their passengers badly. And insurers don't want to fall out with their airlines because they're their clients and make business. Uh, what we need to do is have an open and fair dialogue. And to me, the most important thing that comes out of it is that that has now really begun. Uh, we can debate these points going forward. Uh, I am uh, I'm not with Francesco on the open use um, of um, Article 25, simply because at the end of the day, compensation that insurers give has to be based on legal liability. Uh, and that goes down to the question of compensation. But to me, the most important thing is that we continue the dialogue and try and work out the differences. What I have found, and indeed I thought it was echoed uh, very much in the conference more generally, is that families are understandably anxious to find out what happened to their loved one. They don't like being fobbed off along the way. And if they find out, it helps very much with the grieving process. And so I don't think it's just a question of these legal issues that we have been debating in this session immediately that matter, that the dialogue has to be greater. There has to be done more to assist, and assist uh, the passengers uh, and their families in relation to communicating with them when the disaster happens and all the way through so that everyone knows what's happening and everyone is dealt fairly and with dignity. Thank you so much. Any final questions from the floor before we move on to our last session? No. Well, Francesco and Rob, can I say thank you so much for sharing your insights in, in this subject. Um, it's been great to see you both again, and I look forward to the next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. two speakers um, will provide legal perspectives on a key issue of the moment, 
ICAO's dispute settlement mechanism as set out in Article 84 of the Convention, um, which has also been a subject of judgments issued by the ICJ in 2020. Um, first, we'll hear from Matthew Bourgeois, who is an Associate Legal Officer at ICAO's Legal Affairs and External Relations Bureau. The floor is yours. So good afternoon to all, and thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator. Um, so in the field of civil aviation, like in any other international activities, conflict among states are bound to happen. Conflicting interests may clash, may clash to amount to a conflict, a dispute. And in this connection, the Chicago Convention has entrusted the Council with a dispute settlement mechanism. So. The presentation uh, that I will deliver aims at providing an overview of the dispute settlement mechanism that is entrusted to the Council under the Chicago Convention. Um, so before providing an overview of the, of the mechanism under Article 54 of the Chicago Convention, I will address uh, in more details Chapter 18 of the Chicago Convention, that is to say Articles 84 of the Convention to Article 88. So under Article 84 of the Chicago Convention and under the Transit and the Transport Agreements, uh, the Council of ICAO has been entrusted with a dispute settlement function. Uh, any disagreement between two or more contracting states relating to the interpretation and or the application of the Chicago Convention, its annexes, the uh, Transit or the Transport Agreement, uh, that cannot be settled by negotiations shall, on the application of any state concern in the disagreement, be decided by the Council. Um, during those kind of, uh, during those, the consideration by the Council of those disputes, no member of the Council um, shall vote uh, during those proceedings and also all the decisions that are taken by the Council of ICAO under uh, Chapter 18 uh, of the Chicago Convention can be subject to an appeal before the International Court of Justice. So just now more, more specifically on the uh, other provisions of the Chicago Convention, um, I just wish to point out that Article 85 concerns the arbitration procedure. Uh, so in case there are states uh, that are not uh, uh, parties to the statute of the ICJ, there is the possibility rather than appealing, the, appealing a decision before the ICJ to uh, form an ad hoc arbitral tribunal. Uh, however, given that most uh, most ICAO member states are party to uh, the statute of the uh, are party to the UN Charter and therefore have accepted the statute of the ICJ, this uh, this provision uh, may seem no uh, no longer relevant. Uh, also, Article 86 uh, concerns the effect of the uh, of uh, the effect that a decision of the, uh, the an effect of the effect sorry of uh, of um, a decision of the Council that is under appeal, and Article 87 and Articles 88 uh, concerns the possible sanctions uh, in case of non-compliance of a Council decision. So the dispute that's, that are submitted to, by, uh, to the Council under Chapter 18 are governed by the ICAO rules for the settlement of differences. These rules have been adopted uh, back in 1957, and they were at the time modeled on the 1946 ICJ Rules of Court. Since 1957, these rules have been amended only once in 1975 in order to recognize Russian uh, as a working language. Um, the rules specifically, they define the procedure to be followed by the Council um, for the consideration uh, of the disputes and under the rules, uh, the Council takes its decision on the basis of submission, of written submissions uh, by the parties as well as by uh, oral hearings. 
And what I wish to emphasize is that the rules at all times, the structure, the inherent structure of the rules, make it that uh, they give a priority uh, to the negotiations, to negotiations among the parties during the proceedings. And also, um, the uh, legal committee at, the, uh, at its 37 sessions, which was held in uh, September uh, 2018, uh, decided to include an item uh, concerning the modernization of the rules uh, on its work program, and it was highlighted yesterday by my colleague, Mr. Uh, Andrew Opolot. So now uh, there is a working group of the uh, legal committee that, that uh, is addressing currently this topic about the, uh, the revision of the rules. So to make it more, uh, to make the process basically more efficient. So within ICAO's history, 10 disputes uh, were filed with the organization and four of them are currently uh, pending before the council. Uh, I wish to mention that uh, among, uh, among the disputes that have been solved so far, so the, the first five disputes, uh, it, there were any, um, so the first, sorry, the first six disputes, uh, the council has never issued uh, any decision on the merit at each time, uh, the conciliation, uh, good offices by the president of the council or mediation uh, have been the tools that have been used uh, by the council to solve the disagreement that, uh, the, that, it, that, it, that it was, that the council considered. So these are the uh, cases that have been uh, presented uh, to, uh, to the Council and that uh, so far have been solved, while the first four cases, because the Pakistan-India uh, 1971 is uh, because there were two applications, it, it is considered as, as two cases. So the first, let's say, five cases that are on the slide um, uh, were pertaining to uh, overflight rights. Uh, and the, the last cases uh, was more in the uh, environmental field. And what you can see uh, on the slide now are the current cases that are presently uh, pending before the Council. And I just wish to uh, highlight that for the uh, dispute involving Qatar, Egypt, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates, uh, I just wish to point out that uh, recently uh, in 2021 and, and uh, earlier uh, this year in 2022, um, the, the, the president of the Council recorded the, the discontinuance of the proceedings uh, for Egypt and Saudi Arabia. So technically, the dispute involving Qatar uh, only uh, involves at this time Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates. Uh, and I just also wish to point out that recently, on 14 uh, March 2022, uh, Australia and the Netherlands, they have uh, filed uh, disputes uh, with the Council of ICAO against the Russian Federation. Uh, however, there have been no uh, substantive steps that have been taken by the Council uh, with respect to the, to the disputes that I just mentioned that was filed in, uh, in March uh, of this year. So, as I mentioned, over the year, over the years, sorry, the council has never issued an, a decision on the merit uh, of, a, of a dispute. So, one may wonder, basically, uh, what is the nature of the dispute settlement function of the council? For, inst for instance, does the council act as a judicial, quasi-judicial, political, uh, diplomatic, uh, or does it have uh, hybrid functions when it performs its dispute settlement functions? Uh, and in this connection, I also wish to point out that during the 38th session of the legal committee, uh, which ended on 25th March uh, uh, of last month, um, there were several discussions among states in that regard. So several states expressed the view uh, that the Council was a political body and therefore it was not performing judicial functions, while other states were more of the view that when the Council was performing dispute settlement functions under Article 84, it was in fact uh, uh, performing judicial function. Um, However, it seems that this debate that took place a few weeks ago is not, is not new. Uh, if you search in the uh, proceedings of the uh, Chicago Con Convention, uh, you, will found that, you will find that uh, already in 1944, at the, time of the, of the, at the time of the Chicago Conference, there were a similar debate. Uh, in that case, uh, there were some, some states expressed the view 
that the Council was a quasi-judicial body whose membership would be well qualified to act as an arbitration court, while some other states were of the opinion that the Council was a political body that could not hold such qualifications. So basically, this debate that took place a few months ago, uh, sorry, a few weeks ago, is not, is not new at all. Even the drafters of the Chicago Convention, they could not agree on, uh, what, uh, on how to define uh, the dispute settlement function of the Council. Uh, to add on top of that, uh, a recent judgment issued by the ICJ uh, in, the, in the appeal relating to the jurisdiction of the IQ Council under Article 84 of the Chicago Convention uh, in the uh, aftermath of, the, of a Council decision taken in uh, June 2018 regarding the jurisdiction of the Council to, uh, um, to be seized of the, uh, of the cases involving Qatar. Um, the ICJ uh, as, mentioned, as stated that when the Council performs dispute settlement function, it does not transform itself into a judicial institution in the proper sense of the term. And in this regard, the Court expressed the view that the Council does not have the same characteristics as those of a judicial body, given that it is a permanent organ responsible to the Assembly composed of designated representatives of contracting states elected by the Assembly rather than by individual judges acting independently in their personal capacity. So therefore, the question is, we, there's still this question is, how can we define the dispute settlement function of the Council? So in order to in order to uh, try to find an answer to that question, uh, I believe that we, it requires to examine uh, the roots of what is an international court. And in that regard, the literature in the field of political science as well as international law uh, provides some tools. So I found some criteria um, that, that are used by, in the field of political science and that provide uh, for such uh, definitions. So you can see some of the criteria uh, that are on the screen. They have been developed by the author Cesare Romano, uh, who is a professor at New York University and uh, is in charge of the project on international courts and tribunal. And basically what he argues is that uh, any, any uh, international judicial fora that fails one of these criteria, criteria cannot be considered uh, as having a judicial function. Uh, again, I will not make an analysis of, here of each of these criteria. I believe that you can all make your own assessment. On top of that, uh, and I apologize if I'm being too academic with, with these two slides here, is that there is a, that those criteria can be divided even more. For example, there is an author, uh, Teresa Squitro, uh, which, um, which has uh, developed some eight, eight criteria in order to assess the uh, independence of the decision makers. So again, I do not want to give the impression that these criteria have to be observed or followed. Um, they are found in the existing literature and they may assist you in making your own assessment or your own determination of this, uh, of this matter. So now moving to the other uh, relevant functions of the Council. Um, I just wish to point out that under, so I, I spoke a bit about Article 84 and chapter, which is included in Chapter 18, but in Article 54 uh, of the conventions, which deal with the mandatory function, uh, functions of the convention, there are some other provisions. Among them, uh, there is Article 54N under which uh, the Council shall consider any matter relating to the convention which any contracting states refers to it. Uh, under that provision, it can happen that contracting states to the Chicago Convention can make written submissions to the Council in which they complain about uh, one or more or other contracting, uh, contracting states and in which they request the Council to settle the issue. And whenever a matter is submitted under Article 54N, um, it is not the rules of procedure of the Council, uh, sorry, it is not the, the rules for the, for the settlement of differences uh, that, uh, that apply. Um, it is uh, the, uh, the normal rules of procedure uh, um, of the Council. 
Again, there are also uh, some other provisions which uh, can be invoked, and uh, these two provisions deal more with the infractions uh, to, uh, to the Chicago Convention. And again, whenever a state um, um, invoke those provisions, it is not the, the rules for the settlement of differences that will govern the proceedings, but it will be uh, the, um, the, the normal council rules of procedure. So, in conclusion, uh, in order to solve the, the, the dispute uh, that are submitted to the Council, uh, the, the past practice has shown that negotiation is the principal means uh, of dispute resolution within the ICAO framework, um, that the dispute settlement functions of the Council under Chapter 18 of the Chicago Convention may serve to facilitate the settlement of dispute through negotiations, and that for the other functions uh, of the Council under Article 54 of the Chicago Convention, they may play uh, more uh, of a role in the future in order to promote the safety, the security, uh, or the sustainability of international civil aviation. So this concludes my presentation, and I wish you a, a good afternoon. Thank you so much, Matthew, for that helpful introduction. Um, as a council representative, I think these issues will um, be a much bigger focus in our working life of the forthcoming triennium. Um, next, we'll hear from Young Churcho, who's a partner at Lee & Co, specialising in international aviation law. The floor is yours. Thank you. Ah, thank you, moderator, and also thank you, Matthew, for your wonderful presentation. So, as I'm uh, the last presentation here uh, in the seminar, I'll try to make it as short as possible. Uh, fortunately, uh, a lot of the issues I will be covering overlaps with Matthew's, so I will just skip the parts that Matthew already mentioned in his presentation. And uh, thank you again for uh, having me uh, on this presentation. Uh, anyway, uh, what I will do is I'll try to uh, focus on the expectations and suggestions to the ICAO dispute settlement rather than uh, explaining how the dispute, dispute settlement system works. Anyway, uh, as Matthew pointed out, the ICAO, the convention has Article 84, uh, which uh, I would just like to emphasize that uh, I assume that the drafters assumed a self-contained regime under public international aviation law, uh, which is actually not being implemented right now. And uh, there is a, sort of an appeal process uh, under the ICJ. Uh, just want to clear our two points. Uh, one is that uh, these judicial procedures are not available for the resolution of disputes over bilateral air services agreement that many countries have concluded unless uh, all the relevant states agree upon. And there have been draft proposals for the establishment of an international court for air disputes uh, to bring uniformity to the interpret interpretation of bilateral agreements However, they are in a course as yet. Uh, they had not been uh, implemented. And uh, there are implied powers, Article 54 and 55. Uh, Ma Matthew had mentioned it in the ending of his presentation, so I'll just skip these issues. And there are, of course, other optional dispute resolution system under international aviation law, uh, which is arbitration, of course. Uh, you can decide upon arbitration based on bilateral or multilateral agreements. And there is optional jurisdiction uh, from the ICAO Council. So a number of bilateral aviation treaties, uh, they designate the ICAO Council uh, to deal with potential disputes. However, uh, there have been, until today, no such cases, uh, of course, there are some bilateral aviation treaties uh, designating ICAO Council as the uh, dispute settlement system. And of course, there could be an arbitration by a chamber of the ICJ, which is, of course, arbitral. And ICAO, under the UN, as a specialized agency, 
of the United Nations may request advisory opinions of the ICJ, as you all know. So when this all started, uh, there were, of course, uh, high expectations, uh, and this dispute settlement me mechanism was hailed. Uh, and however, at least, you know, considering many scholars, there exists a significant amount of opinion that the ACO Council has not been, has been very ineffective in carrying out its judicial functions. However, I would like to emphasize, and I've, I'm of the opinion that there needs to be a more balanced critique of the Council's performance, because on the one hand, when focused on the narrower aspect of their arbitral mandate, it could be regarded that the Council has somewhat failed to live up to the early expectations. However, on the other hand, when looking at the broader objective of resolving interstate conflicts, the Council has performed pretty well. So, uh, I'll just mention the uh, individual critiques that are discussed uh, generally and uh, find a way uh, to make another critique that there are no issues and we could overcome those issues. Uh, there's always this critique that the council lacks judicial independence. The point is that, of course, as a political body, the members of the council do not possess measure of independence of an unbiased, neutral decision maker that one normally expects of a judge. Uh, however, there is no explicit provision to that effect in the convention. Article 15 merely stipulates that no council members may be actively associated with or financially interested in any air service operation. Uh, more fundamentally, the Akayo Council is composed of states, uh, not individuals, in their personal capacity elected by General Assembly. In practice, however, the Council has not undergone any serious criticism of its impartiality caused by the absence of judicial independence. Furthermore, the governments on the Council and their representatives may not behave in complete disregard of legal and political constraints. Any decisions must be based by sound arguments, not only in the council chamber, but also eventually in terms of public justification. The procedures enshrined in the rules and subsequent deliberations ensure some degree of legitimacy. It is also the council as a whole, as opposed to its individual representatives, that takes a decision. As such, as far as I view it, the council has tried its utmost to look impartial even in potentially polarizing conflicts in the past. Ultimately, any wrong decision on the part of the Council would clearly invite an appeal to the ICJ, which would likely overrule the Council's decision, thus delegitimizing it. So uh, I see it that there is actually no lack of impartiality and uh, uh, equally absent in the Council's a judicial competency to deliver judgment through legally sound reasoning and deliberation. Uh, there is a, always this critique and uh, compared to the ICJ, uh, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, they exceed as they require judges or arbitrators to be well qualified with recognized competence in the relevant field of law. Uh, the convention does not prescribe any qualification, not to mention judicial competency for council representatives. The council is mainly composed of aviation bureaucrats and diplomats rather than jurists capable of delivering uh, coherent judicial decisions. So as a result, uh, they are not so much influenced by legal discourse as by politics, and the council cannot be expected to carry out its judicial function and render decisions which the contracting states would perceive to be entirely rule-based and judicially meaningful. And uh, in terms of orientation, the council may be best characterized as political organ of sovereign states working uh, in a parliamentary setting. Uh, I would also like to emphasize that, however, that the ICAO proved its usefulness by addressing with exemplary uh, diplomatic dexterity uh, on several contentious issues, uh, as the 2001 Gaza International Airport destruction and so on. And uh, 
It indicates that the council has been generally reluctant to be judgmental, uh, to positively determine that there has been a violation of the convention, and to expressly identify the contract states in the breach. Uh, also, uh, there, uh, Article 54, I'll just skip that because it has been mentioned before. So there are also minor cr critiques such as cost and delay, it costs too much, it's too expensive, and it, uh, it's too long. And uh, isn't council reluctant to adjudicate? Uh, and also some commenters argue the restricted use of powers. So the, when you use, see the usage rate of the council as a dispute resolution firm, it has been fairly low. Um, and especially not under any bilateral aviation agreements and uh, no merits of the disputes under Article 84. So uh, these are my, are my expectations and suggestions. So the expectation, expectation would be, first of all, the council still you know, considers itself tasked with assisting to settle, and assisting to settle is very important. And they still encourage the parties to negotiate. Um, and it's a viable avenue for a contract and state in dispute. So the state can bring an international dimension to an otherwise bilateral dispute, moving from the bilateral negotiation table to the council cham chamber. And uh, also, uh, what we can expect is that any of the parties could have declined the offer and sought a legally binding decision. However, it appears that all the parties thought it worth attempting diplomacy once more under the council and with a set of time limit. And then, uh, these are my final suggestions uh, to the dispute settlement system. As far as we can not, we, we only have the dispute settlement system right now, I think the council should concentrate on what it has done best so far, conflict resolution by means of good offices, mediation and conciliation. And the ICAO encountered many sources of dispute and adopted corresponding methods such as fact-finding, especially fact-finding. Uh, the council should retain and expand such procedural flexibility as it deems most effective for any pending case. Uh, for, for instance, a fact-finding mission may be appropriate in case of an air accident, whereas conciliation would be more appropriate for politically charged disputes. And this ADR-type strategy will be particularly effective when the real purpose of the parties to dispute is to settle rather than to seek legal guidance, which is in fact the case in most of the cases here in the international aviation disputes. And uh, you can also resort uh, to the rules for the settlement of uh, differences, Article 6.2. Uh, instead of undertaking adjudication of the dispute on its own as a whole, the council may appoint a committee composed of five council representative member states not concerned in the disagreement, who also has legal competence? The selection of qualified and impartial representatives of the council will enhance its legitimacy and competency. Uh, so that's it for my presentation. Uh, thank you again for listening. Thank you so much for another pair of effective and complimentary uh, presentations um, on this um, issue. I'm also glad that you, you raised IECJ because I do think that's the ultimate uh, judicial destination um, for many actors when we look at this process. Um, we have about 10 minutes left for questions um, before we have a hard stop um, for the, the closing ceremonies um, of the cinema, uh, seminar. Um, do we have um, any questions from the floor? I see one at the back middle. My name is Jam Alden. I am from Uzbekistan, Minister of Transportation, and also I am uh, President uh, Korea Airspace University. Today's and yesterday's seminars sounded very beautiful presentations on carbon emission, what are the plans for the future, as well as the low aviation settlement mechanism and other topics. Before asking question, I want to give an example about the use of airspace. For example, Finland Airlines currently in bankrupt condition because they are prohibited from using the airspace of the largest neighbor. 
Bypassing this airspace is beyond their power. In fact, many airlines are also beyond their power yet, because uh, yesterday uh, Mr. Gilberto Lopez Mayor told us how the Korean airlines also choosing a very long destination to the flying to the Europe. If uh, some companies uh, don't fly to the Russia in order to avoid sanction, others don't use this airspace as a principle, as a punishment, and uh, this leads to the lengthening of the flights as well as an increase in carbon emissions too. That is, uh, uh, our principles are to show the result only on paper, but in real life it's opposite, and it's true. Now the question is, uh, is it not time to take action and establish uh, the single standard for the obliging and the using and provision of the airspace? Because uh, autumn assembly is ahead. Big, and because the use of airspace affects not only to the activities of the airlines, but also the non-fulfillment or delay of the obligations to the reduce carbon emissions as well as the economies of the countries. That's it. Thank you so much. I think that question is about liberalizing airspace more generally. Matthew, would you like to have a first go? Uh, yes, thank you for your, your question. Uh, in relation with the dispute settlement, um, and if I can put your question in context of dispute settlement, uh, I believe that uh, the, what I, something that maybe was not clear in the presentation is that any, whenever uh, Article 84 or Chapter 18 is invoked, uh, it, is, it should be by states. Um, therefore, airlines um, cannot invoke uh, the mechanism. Uh, it is only states that um, can uh, introduce uh, or present a dispute uh, before the council. So if there is any issue um, with, uh, with airspace, it is, it is not for airline, it is, uh, uh, it is for states uh, specifically. Thank you. Thank you, and I see we have had a couple more questions. There was one in the front here, and there was one over here on the left. Where's the microphone? Okay. So why do we go here first, and then we'll move over here? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is Shifali Juneja. I am a representative of India in the ICO Council. I would like to thank both the legal experts for their very, very informative presentation. And my question is regarding the working of the ICAO Council. And most, uh, both of the speakers uh, said that uh, ICAO Council, to some extent, uh, has uh, been working more on negotiation rather than dispute settlement. And my question here is that if you look at another UN organization, that is the UN Security Council, which in some ways also looks at dispute management, but has the power of binding resolutions on member states. ICAO, on the other hand, does not have the power of binding resolution on the member state to settle disputes. Do you think this is one of the reasons why ICAO does not go into dispute settlement, would rather like to take it through resolution and negotiation and mediation? Is that the reason? Thank you. Thank you so much. Young, would you like to answer that question? Thank you. Uh, so, uh, uh, thanks for the uh, wonderful question. Uh, well, I would like to ask Matthew first. So. Uh, any decision by the ICAO Council regarding the dispute is finally binding, right? As far as I know. It's, it's f final and binding unless it is appealed uh, before Appeal. the ICJ mm -hmm. or an arbitral uh, tribunal. So, uh, so uh, the ICAO Council's dispute settlement system, the ICAO Council's decision is final and binding, uh, subject to appeal to the ICJ and also uh, there's, there's another uh, process, of course, arbitration. Uh, however, it is with all dispute settlement systems under international public law, even the ICJ. If there is a decision by the ICJ, uh, first of all, the two states have to agree upon to go to the ICJ. 
except for four or five uh, issues uh, under I Article 38 of the uh, ICJ statute. And uh, another issue is when a state does not comply with the uh, ICJ's decision or ICAO Council's decision, the only way to implement is under the resolution of the uh, United Nations Security Council, uh, which is Charter 7 uh, of the uh, United Nations Security Council. And it's really hard to implement it. I've never, I don't think there was ever a real case, uh, even under the ICJ's decision, which has been implemented. So, but that's international law. So, <laughs> I think that could be the answer. Thank you. And Matthew, do you have anything to add to this question? No? Thank you so much. Was there another question over here? Uh, good afternoon. My name is Peter Maliboba from AFCAC. Uh, I would like to highly commend uh, the, the speakers uh, for such a, a well uh, demonstrated ex exposition of the subject. Uh, I must confess that I'm one of those who have been very critical about the role of uh, the council uh, in its uh, uh, Article 18 functions imposed by, uh, on it by the, con uh, by the, sh the convention. Uh, and um, wondering what, why, how a political uh, uh, body can uh, uh, assume dispute settlement rule uh, that would appear to be neutral, uh, objective, and so forth. Uh, particularly uh, being a political body uh, in, uh, entrusted with the functions of uh, interpretation and uh, application of uh, the convention provisions when uh, I'm not aware it has let's say, a subcommittee or committee uh, purposely uh, uh, performing those functions. Uh, but listening to the second part of the presentation, I, I, I got my answer <laughs> from Mr. Chu, uh, and I'm well pleased with that, and his recommendation uh, that the council should focus on what it does best, uh, mediation, uh, uh, good offices rule uh, and so forth. And I, I think I, I would, I would uh, highly commend and, and, and go by that. I, I thank you and please accept my congratulations once more. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for the wonderful question. So, uh, so, it, so uh, your, your question was to summarize is uh, the political function of the ICAO Council and uh, so what effect it has, right, uh, compared to the judicial? I, I couldn't like fully understand your question. Sorry. Uh, yeah, the microphone. Uh, it was more of a contribution than a question. Oh, a contribution, yeah. yes, okay. Yes, but I just also wanted to add that. I mean, those functions should be clearly delineated. Exactly. The political so, functions, the mm -hmm. administrative functions, and the uh, Functions of uh, facilitating negotiations and uh, right, 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 right. should be delineated from that of the quasi-judicial role that they should play. Thank you. Uh, so uh, you've pointed out perfectly that you know in a domestic legal procedure, there's always a winner and a loser. So in a domestic court, when the court makes its final rendering, so judgment, there's a winner and a loser. And of course, like one of the parties is satisfied, but the other party is not. And in international politics, sometimes that's not possible. So uh, the council, I think, has effect, you know, has been functioning pretty well in this political part because uh, it, when there's a dispute, there was no winner or loser. Uh, Every, every issue has been politically uh, very much uh, solved, resolved. And uh, I kind of really highly regard ICAO Council's uh, position on 
letting the parties negotiate and come, come kind of to a conclusion. Uh, and until today, there has been no uh, serious conflict, aviation uh, legal conflicts, I think, uh, disputes that has not been resolved so far. Thank you. Matthew, would you like to add anything? Yes, thank you for, for your comment. Uh, if I may just say something is that I believe that no matter whether the council is considered to have a judicial or a political function, uh, what I believe is that one of the important aspects is that um, the, cons the dispute settlement function of the council should be carried the most efficiently possible. And uh, I think that uh, in that regard, one way to achieve that is by the uh, modernization of the IQ rules for the settlement of differences. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think there is very much a natural inclination for the Council to lean towards mediation and consensus rather than decision. Um, we're now at the end of the session. Um, thank you so much to all of our speakers today for sharing their time and their thoughts with us. I'd also like to thank the audience for their engagement too. It's been an excellent discussion. Thank you so much. And also, thank you very much. We need another big round of applause to the moderator, Mr. Andrew A. Hall-Henley. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your various uh, information and also the opinions for the development of aviation sector. Thank you very much, Ruben Sigan. And after a while, we'll start the closing ceremony to wrap up the seminar as soon as the stage is cl uh, cleaned without any break time. Yes, many attendees have gathered uh, for the first time in a while and had time to discuss about international aviation legislation and think of what policies should be enforced to help recover the aviation industry which suffers due to the pandemic. I would like to sincerely thank our on-site participants and all viewers from YouTube, YouTube channel for joining us for this uh, seminar. Then and now, ladies and gentlemen, now let us begin the closing ceremony. Or we need, uh, we need a little bit of time. So as uh, just uh, uh, waiting for the, our uh, distinguished guests uh, for the closing ceremony, uh, just uh, let us take a look at the issues that we have uh, discussing over the past two days. Yes, yeah, so we had a keynote speech and a session on the first day that we thought about how the difficult situation of aviation industry can go back uh, to normal uh, a little bit faster yet safety in a time of pandemic as well as uh, we discussed about the role ICAO should play in the legal aspects of aviation and also discussed the safety and security in the aviation sector. Yes, of course, the, uh, you can remember the traditional Korean performance and raffle draw we enjoyed together at ICAO's 75th anniversary commemoration banquet were also a very great time for us that, that uh, united us. And precious opinions and information we shared today uh, this seminar may an unforgettable time, I think, as we met after a long time because of the COVID-19, so that uh, once more, ladies and gentlemen, to our ICAO, all members, and the Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, and Transport, the Republic of Korea, for making these wonderful times possible, please uh, give a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, ladies and gentlemen, once more, please welcome. We have Deputy Minister of uh, Land, in, uh, Land Infrastructure and uh, Transforma Transformation, uh, Yong Sung Kim, will deliver uh, his message to wrap up uh, this seminar. Please welcome him once again. Uh, hello. Good afternoon. Uh, Honorable uh, Secretary General Juan Carlos Sal uh, Salazar of ICAO, Director uh, Michael Gill of Legal Affairs and External 
Relations Bureau of ICAO, panelists who have delivered insightful presentations and made discussions naive and productive and distinguished guests. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to you all. This year's seminar was the first ICAO International Aviation Legal Seminar to be held after the COVID-19 pandemic declaration and it was a meaningful event that commemorates the 70th anniversary of Korea's accession to ICAO and the 75th anniversary of the establishment of the ICAO Legal Committee. Today, we live the issues in the international aviation community together to realize the goal of the safe and sustainable recovery of global aviation. In particular, it also great honor to exchange wisdom and experiences in areas ranging from aviation safety and security to climate change and future aviation with the participants. I am certain that the discussions we had in this seminar will be defined and more developed in the ICAO Council and the for the first ICAO assembly in September, thereby laying the foundation for the international aviation community to leap forward into the future. It was unfortunate that we could only enjoy each other's company only briefly, so I do look forward to meeting you all again at the 41st ICAO Assembly in September. As a member of the ICAO Council, Korea will continue to make its utmost effort to contribute to the sustainable growth and development of international civil aviation. Lastly, I would like to extend my profound gratitude to all the uh, participants, I wish you a safe journey home. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Minister Yong Song Kim, for coming all the way here to thank everyone for their hard work during the last two days. And thank you very much once again. So now, ladies and gentlemen, and next. Uh, we'll have the closing remarks from the director, Michael Gill, of Legal Affairs and External Relations at Brew, ICAO. Please welcome him once again with a big round of applause. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Deputy Minister. Uh, distinguished guest, Secretary General. Um, it's uh, a privilege for me just to say a few uh, closing remarks on behalf of ICAO and the Secretariat as we come to the end of what has really been a, a memorable uh, event uh, for all of us. And I wanted to start by thanking all of you participants for taking part uh, in these discussions so actively. We've seen a high level of interest, a high level of engagement, both on the floor of the meeting and, of course, uh, when we've had the opportunity to exchange uh, informally on the fringes of the event. Um, this has been a hugely successful seminar. We've managed to bring together 900 participants, obviously um, relying on the hybrid nature of the event, but um, coming from 114 states. Um, so from a geographic perspective, that really is um, very impressive. It shows a broad uh, range of different perspectives um, able to uh, take part in, in the event. Um, and even in the room here uh, in Seoul, uh, we've had um, almost 300 participants at different points in the course of the, uh, the two days. So thank you to all of our uh, participants for having um, been such a, an active and willing audience. Um, I think we've seen um, a, a broad range of different topics uh, covered. Um, it really shows 
um, that um, the term aviation law covers such a, a wide, wide range of topics, a wide range of very interesting and, and challenging um, issues. So we've seen um, issues around the recovery from the COVID pandemic, uh, the application of health measures on board aircraft, and how that can impact on the management uh, of um, unruly passengers. We had a really excellent um, presentations today on pilotless aircraft. We looked at the issue of cyber security. We looked at climate change, support to accident victims, uh, just hearing now uh, on the settlement of disputes function of ICAO, and of course, um, ICAO's activity in promoting the ratification of air law instruments. A really broad and very rich agenda. And again, I thank you all for having um, played your part uh, in making those topics so lively. Um, I would like to again thank all of our speakers, um, both here in presence, uh, present and um, virtually, sharing their, ex uh, their, their knowledge, their experience, giving up their time, some of them at very um, inhumane hours um, when they've been joining virtually. But um, again, we wouldn't have been able to have such a rich dialogue without them. Um, again, from um, my own personal point of view, but also on behalf of ICAO, I did want to thank our organizers, Director Crystal Kim and her excellent committed team uh, at the ministry um, have really um, smoothed all of the arrangements. They've made us all feel extremely welcome, um, but also they've put together such a, a fantastic, um, uh, made some such, such fantastic arrangements. And um, I also wanted to um, recognize the contribution of uh, my colleagues in the Legal Bureau, Andrew Opelot in particular, who's really um, guided our um, contribution to the seminar, along with Christopher Petras, and Mathieu Vaugeois. Um, so uh, the combined um, forces of, um, of the Ministry uh, of um, uh, Land Infrastructure and Transport here, along with the Re Legal Bureau, I think have done such a great job. So perhaps I could ask you all to give a round of applause to our organizers. Thank you. And let me just close then in, in thanking our hosts generally for such generous hospitality. I've talked a lot about the uh, content of the seminar, but I think the social events have also been particularly rich and, and memorable. We celebrated the 70th anniversary uh, of uh, the Republic of Korea adhering to the Chicago Convention, but we also celebrated the 75th anniversary of the establishment of the Legal Committee. Uh, I'd say in both events in really quite some style, and the bar has been set very high for us to try and continue those celebrations throughout the rest of 2022. Um, I'm always um, struck uh, here in uh, the Republic of Korea by the way you manage to combine um, traditional and uh, modern culture and, and really give it such a distinct uh, flavor. And um, those events, I think, will live long in the memory for all of us who were able to, to uh, participate. So thank you to our hosts for such generous hospitality. Um, I wish you all safe travels home. I wish you all uh, good health. And we look forward to seeing you all very soon at the ICAO Assembly in September, if not on a future occasion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Director, for helping make this seminar more informative as uh, supporting this seminar so that we can gather and share various information despite a hard, hardship of COVID-19. So with that closing remarks, it brings us to the end of all programs of seminar. Uh, we, uh, we were able to meet face-to-face uh, -face, uh, after such a long time. By all means, I hope to see everyone next time without any face mask smiling. So I hope you, you will always uh, watch out for the coronavirus and stay healthy. Thank you very much. I will not forget everyone's hard work. Until now, my name's Sorry Moon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.